Hello, and thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Jason Wirth, and i um, a professor of philosophy here at Seattle University and co-director and founder of the Seattle University Eco Sangha, a Soto Zen practice group. And I'd like to begin our interview uh, by doing something very important to me, which is putting on this garment right here. It's called a rock suit. And this is one of the ways in which we publicly announce the seriousness of our desire to have a healthy and strong practice. And the reason why I'm wearing it right now is I would like to remember that the best teachers are at the same time the best students and that teachers and students work together as friends. To be a good student, I think you have to have a clear mind and an open heart. And that's what I endeavor to do in my practice. And that's why I put this on to help me remember what I'm trying to do because we have a very extraordinary opportunity right now, which is our opportunity to learn from one of the great legends and teachers of the Pacific Northwest, Father Pat Tui. I think to know uh, Pat is to be a better person. Uh, I've heard that from everyone. That's always been my experience. Um, it seems that no matter where you go in the state of Washington, everyone knows him. And I think he's been, in both word and deed, one of our great teachers. And so tonight, um, we're here to learn from him. And he's devoted his adult life to working with the indigenous peoples of the United States, especially the West. And so I'd like first to welcome you. Thank you. And uh, we'll start very broadly by asking you to share with us a little bit about how you came to work as a Jesuit with indigenous peoples, especially here in the state of Washington. Uh, you bet. Thank you, Jason, for your kind words. I appreciate it very much. I, I grew up uh, in Yakima, Washington, so I was aware of Native people from the time I was young because of the Yakima Nation there, and I played ball uh, with a young man from the Yakima Nation. So I knew the people were around. I didn't think I would ever really get to know them deeply. I used to see the grandmothers downtown, and I wondered, gee, I would like to know them, but I never thought I ever could. And as the years went on, I think I was always attracted in some way to Native people. Uh, I would go to things where they were present, and powwows and things, and I was always attracted to them for some reason. And I grew up uh, with a picture of a native warrior since I was a little boy. It was always was in my psyche. Um, eventually, in 1973, I was at Gonzaga University, and I just had an intuition and a feeling that I wanted to go and uh, be on the res, uh, which was the Colville res in eastern Washington. And so I went there, and uh, literally, I, I just lost my life there into another world, and I never came back. I was going to come back to the university, but I never came back. Uh, I was so taken with the people. And I think one of my main questions uh, since I was very young was, uh, can there be a, a profound friendship between people of different color across different lines of culture? Uh, different histories, uh, can that be bridged in any way through friendship? Uh, could we really get to know one another? And when I came to the res for the first time, I knew that I was just there to learn. I knew nothing. And it seemed like all of my old knowledge, I've been to school for a long time. I'm very lucky with education. And it seemed like it all vanished from my head it seemed like I had to start over with the river and with the land and with the horses and the, all the animals and and start with the res dogs who were everywhere around my place and start with the kids uh, and gradually start to meet the elders and I think everybody realized right away I was there to learn uh, not so much to change them or convert anybody there was a Catholic tradition there for a long time, since the mid-1800s. But it, 
I would certainly honor that uh, when people were interested in pursuing that. But I was there for everybody uh, equally, longhouse or church or anything. I was there for them equally. And I learned from everybody, from the kids on up to the ancient elders. And I knew elders that were born in the 1800s. So there's a lot of knowledge there. And and I, I was enjoyed my time in church, and then I would go to other churches. And a thing I enjoyed especially much when I was living in Nespelen was going to the longhouse. And I began to learn, learn immediately there. And these were the, uh, descendants of Joseph's band of people, Chief Joseph's band. And they were remarkably lovely people. And they had held the tradition and I, I went in through the kitchen with a young man who s took me there. And I went in and the grandmas all started laughing and no priest had ever come through the kitchen there. No priest had been to the longhouse actually. And uh, they all laughed and said, come on in, you know, we'll get you something to eat. And then, then they said, go in and uh, Joseph Red Thunder, he'll take care of you. He was the, the leader for the longhouse then. And I went in and shook hands with Joe, and uh, he said, sit beside me and just watch, and you'll learn our ways. So that was my beginning. And from then, it's just been that way the whole way of, of meeting one another, uh, knowing one another, becoming friends, listening, learning, and then the world's open. They just keep opening and opening. And I, I love this adventure. Because there's always more. <laughs> there's always more profundity that the people have because they've been here untold thousands of years, 12, 15,000 years at least. And uh, they know they've been very well taught by the holy. and. Uh, there's just so much to know, so much to learn, so much to appreciate. And it's enriched me a great deal. Yeah. You know, uh, there's been so much historical hurt, especially directed their direction, imperial aggression. Mm -hmm. How have you been able to find practices of healing that make this really important friendship possible and this really important dialogue in which we can at last become students. Yeah, the, what is often referred to as the enormous historical trauma, the endless series of shocks, waves of grief and pain and loss uh, is a, certainly a reality and, and we still feel it every day uh, with the people. But they have showed remarkable resilience and and a brilliant adaptability to keep their people alive. Up to 80% were wiped out with uh, different European diseases and the remnant had to hang on and, and gradually the aggression of, of the American government was extraordinarily cruel and uh, their land taken, their waters taken, everything taken. And then the disrespect for their original spiritual ways uh, total disrespect in many ways, uh, thinking that, well, it didn't matter. They should all become Europeans and they should all become church-going folks. And uh, there was no respect for what they already had. And that troubled me from the very beginning uh, when we'd have working with the young and we'd be teaching church teachings and which their grandparents wanted for them but I, I couldn't do it without first acknowledging what they already had before there were any churches and the depth of what they had. And, but to do that in any way, I had to follow the advice and the lead of the elders. Uh, very complex, very mm. complex. So there's a ton of pain. And uh, in my early years, it used to shatter me. And... Uh, I 
sometimes felt like I couldn't go anymore, I couldn't go on. We had so much death, we had so much pain and sadness. And uh, I was, I had lived a pretty privileged life, you know, uh, middle class, a lot of education, opportunity. Um, I'd never been in that kind of a sea of pain, and sorrow, and all the losses and grandparents who had lost all their children and grandchildren. Uh, so I was oftentimes in a type of despair, I think, because uh, I didn't, I didn't know, uh, I really didn't know I absorbed things totally, so I don't have much defense mm -hmm. of it. So um, I didn't know how to survive. And my only way was to hang on to just sit with, be with uh, some of the elders, and, uh, and they would steady me just by the way their manners and, and their tremendous faith, and come, uh, they were beautiful. Uh, and they'd lost so much. And I came into the work in the time of the uh, great unrest with the um, American Indian Movement in the 70s is when I came in, and so there was a lot a lot of uh, anger and a lot of rejection of white people and church and government. All They all lumped together. They're seen as all part of the one colonial wave. And so I was in that, so I'm white. <laughs> I belong to the Catholic Church. And uh, I, I, uh, I'm not a government person, but I, I just all gets lumped together. And it was hard. It was hard. I think the only thing that kept me uh, going was their kindness to me, because they they would direct the anger uh, viciously, you know, a hard anger towards what had happened to them and what had been done to them, and I would be there listening for hours, and uh, but then as for me personally, uh, they wouldn't direct it to me personally. Uh, somehow, I. They gave me a grace there of, of just being there and being with them. and um, But it was hard. Uh, sometimes after a lot of that anger comes out and, and, and revisiting the history, I, I feel like crawling out the door on my hands and knees, you know. Uh, it's a, been a hard time. And uh, the European Americans have been really hard. They, they deal hard. And they still do. So I think I, I just try to follow their lead on this. And we make efforts. Uh, we make efforts. I don't know. We have a lot of work to do on this. Uh, mm -hmm. But I have to just follow, see where they want to go, what they want to do. I don't have any answers. I, I, I learn how they handle it. And and they usually move, uh, my mo closest friends have moved through a lot of anger and uh, and then they come to a place of serenity. And uh, and it's hard work. And I sort of walked, I walked through it with them. <laughs> and, mm. and I have to deal with that in myself. And, and then they come to it and then they begin to wish to make allies with those who they think understand them and will walk with them in a respectful way. And, and then we move forward. So I find that, especially today, we've come a long ways in building bridges and friendships of trust because the history has been so cruel, wow. so cruel. And uh, people can't trust easily because history has betrayed them. Uh, any trust they had in the government and the churches too. So, yeah, it's just slow. And, and I have to follow, see what they want to do to heal. And then I just try to go with them. And, and I need to be healed myself with them. Yeah, you know, in, in Zen practice, at our best, we at least aspire 
we vow with all our power to become like an ocean that mm. can receive all seas. Mm. And it's easier, of course, to do that when you're receiving the hurts of others. But when you have to receive hurt, and it's been a hurt that is in some way related to the fact that we're here, that means you have to be a really, really big ocean mm. and really go out on a limb, I think, yeah. and find new ways. But as we try to find new ways, how do you reconcile the classic way of being a Jesuit mm -hmm. with these new challenges, especially given that the Jesuits like our white male skin? Mm -hmm. Those also are symbols of the problem and symbols of the hurt. Mm -hmm. How have you reconciled these two? Yeah, uh, we've definitely been in the Northwest. We've been with, since eighteen forty with the people, so we're in one hundred and seventy-five years together, and we've been friend and we've been foe. Uh, not deliberately foe, but definitely we've been foe at times. Uh, to their cultural ways, through the way we uh, took them to boarding schools and would try to erase their uh, culture. Uh, and that was also an enormous government plan, which uh, somehow we became connected to. I think in the early days, in the 40s, 1840s, 50s, 60s, 70s, the Jesuits were, um, they were more open, I think, to just traveling with the people, being with the people. But they also had this uh, feeling that without education, that people would be fall prey easily to the enormous immigrant population that was just falling over the Northwest in massive waves. So that the education was seen as a way to adapt and cope uh, with what was coming. And the Jesuits wanted to, to engage in that and their first idea was to be a buffer uh, between the, colonial, the American colonial powers and, with, and using education as a tool. But everything moved too quickly and, uh, and a lot of those dreams just fell by the wayside because uh, there were so many things happening like the Dawes Act, which took away their the small reservations, they'd, all, they'd been reducing their reservations just steadily. And they finally ended up with something, and then they opened up the Allotment Act, and, and so they gave little allotments to Maine families, and they opened the rest of the rest to non-Indians. And most of my elders and teachers said, that's killed us. That really hurt us. Mm -hmm. That really hurt us. And so we were... And then, and the Jesuits were in the, we had wars. Um, uh, there, was, there was hard conflicts with the U United States Cavalry. And the Jesuits were here, we were right in it. And, uh, and they tried to be brokers of peace in the midst of horrific conflict and betrayal. So I looked, I've looked at it like a marriage. Uh, we've been with the people because they've allowed us to be with them, um, and we like to be with them, and but it's like a marriage. Uh, it has its rough spots, <laughs> and then it has its joyful spots, and sometimes we got it right, and sometimes we didn't get it right at all. But what I found in the people is that they embrace us. Even in, when we get it wrong, they still embrace us with their hearts because they know we're trying, we're trying. And that's the way they've treated me, that I've made a thousand mistakes and I've hurt people and, and still I can't believe how they have always kept hanging on to me and holding me in their hearts and minds. And it, it's more beyond, it's beyond my comprehension because I know I really messed up so many ways and yet they keep holding me and I think it's because they know my heart. In my heart, I really love them, and I want to live with them and be with them, and I want to learn, learn, learn the life way, uh, and live the life way. And they know I make mistakes, but they can hold that somehow. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. 
Do you ever find resistance to the conflict between mm. the indigenous life ways and what people would expect from a Jesuit? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, this has been, uh, these are questions I've asked myself uh, for 42 years. So how do we do, how do we make our way and together and now it's clear, more clear to me, at least a little bit, um, that I think in the early years there was an attitude like, leave the old life ways. They're no longer useful to you. The world has changed. And the world had changed. And their whole relationship to their land, their wife, everything had been interrupted. And so their language, everything. And so, uh, leave that and just become good Catholics, you know, and, uh, but the people resisted that, and, uh, and today I give thanks every day they did, and they still resist that, because they know deep down that they have a sacred life way that's been passed down to them for thousands of years, and they had to take it underground and to hold on to it. Because if they tried to practice openly, they'd be persecuted by the churches and um, by the government. And there's there's some really funny stories about that. But uh, I remember the old timers in uh, when I used to live in Inchilium, the Colville Res. They talk about that. Of, they'd be up all night at a winter dance and uh, and working with spiritual medicine. And it's a beautiful. I love winter dance. I love being in there. And uh, and then the next morning they'd be up all night anyway. So some of them would go to mass. They'd walk down and go to mass, but they'd never tell the priest, you know, that they'd been all night at a, a winter dance. And um, because they knew he wouldn't grasp that, mm -hmm. he wouldn't see that 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 was necessary. That's what the changes I think. He didn't know that was necessary, but that is necessary because <laughs> it's like it's uh, they're who they are deep down, the deepest of themselves who they are to be able to practice their spiritual life ways. And then they can still relate if they want to with Catholic life ways. But the, the last 50 years uh, has been a remarkable reaffirmation and reclamation and of the, the original life ways. And I just happened to start when that was just gaining momentum. And so I wanted to be, uh, I wanted to be with my friends as they made that effort. And it's still going on. And uh, the other day I was up at Lummi and we were celebrating a victory for the Lummi had won a great victory for all of us when they got the Army Corps to recognize their treaty rights and, and not to harm their fishing waters and not to let the trains of coal come in yes. and create this horrific coal port and, and pollute the waters and then take it overseas and then it comes back as smoke and pollutes their fishing. Everything polluted. The, so they, they won. They won. And I went up to the gathering. I wanted to be there so bad. And it was so ecstatic. It was so ecstatic because they were able to protect their lands and their waters. And their ceremony, all the ceremonies, there's so much were done by the young the warrior dances and songs and the elders of fiery speeches. And the joy, it was like now I, I said to myself, now I can die and go to heaven because their life way is totally alive. Their life was totally alive, and they were so exuberant, <laughs> so exuberant, and and so respectful at the same time, which is their culture, because the 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 Army Corps representative, a colonel, was there, and they stood him up several times as speakers, and they honored him. They said, "You stood up for us, and we honor you," and they blanketed him. But it was all within the context of what they carry, as my friends say. They carry, they carried this beautiful life way. And it was just the power of it, oh. the power of it. And I said, now I can, now I can go to heaven. 
No, we can go to heaven. But that's, I'm convinced that that is central to, to the people's ongoing joy and power and serenity is the, the strength, the reaffirmation and the living of their life way. Yeah. yeah. And I think we all owe a huge debt of gratitude to the Lummi people and for indigenous people more broadly. Yeah. They really have been fighting the good fight for all of us. And I wonder if in part their teaching is the following. And we think we live here and therefore we don't want to mess up our house, but it's our surroundings <clears throat> and maybe our surroundings should be nice and clean. But the indigenous perspective is not that they live here, they are here. Mm -hmm. You can't take care of yourself without taking care of your place. To take care of your place is to take care of yourself and your life ways. Yeah. Have you found that to be the case? Oh, yes. Yeah. It's all so integrated. Um, and I remember uh, Mary Marchand was one of the elders from Colville Res. She told me once, she said, you know, non-Indian people will never understand how we feel about our land, you know, our waters, our rivers. Um, they just, they can't grasp how we feel about that, how we are connected to our land and water. And I think that's true because we move and, but this is their place and, and they've been here long, long time and their elders' bones are in that ground, and and the connection to the beloved, the ones who've gone ahead, is all right there, and all their all their sacred medicines are there. Everything is there, and it's all connected for them. And to be shoved off of their land and moved around was horrific, and or to have their lands flooded or torched uh, was horrific, and to have their longhouses burnt, uh, horrific, awful. And we can't, I don't think as European Americans, we can really comprehend the intensity of how their spirituality, I can't even put words on it. It's a living, it's, it's, it's related to earth and water and light and living ones and ancestors and everything it is the book as they say you know it is the living book in which you learn everything you need to know and life itself is the teacher how you live your life is your teacher and your elders correcting you scolding you kidding you anything to keep you in line as you make all your mistakes and gradually learn this cohesion of that I can't even find words for it, this reality that it's very, it's very hard now. I remember talking to Johnny R. Lee once we were flying in the plane and, and we we're going back to a conference. He's from Flathead in Montana and uh, I love him, respect him, spiritual man. And uh, I was talking to him and he was raised by his grandparents and he knows the language really well. He was raised in a in the old old way, and uh, I said, "Is it is it getting harder?" <laughs> and he said, "Well, look, you know, uh, I have this cell phone here on my hip, and I have this nine to five <laughs> job, and and I don't live out like my grandparents did, you know, in the forest and silence, and 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 uh, I think the old timers had a connection." Mm to all living ones and to the spiritual world that was so intense because, because the world, their world hadn't been so vastly interrupted by all this noise uh, that came from Europe and all this chaos <laughs> that came from Europe. And, but we try, we try as much as we can to regain that. And dancers here on the coast, you know, they still go in the mountains to, you know, to fast and pray, and they go to the streams to bathe. And hard to find a place that isn't polluted, but they try to find a place and protect it. Um, they're still connected, even though there's all this extra noise, you know, because of the surrounding culture. Uh, they're still connected to it, 
and it's their lifeblood. And the elders' advice is still there, you know. Because uh, they're my buddies, you know. I, I could say the same for myself, you know. We don't, most of us don't even begin to grow up at all until in our 40s or more. And, um, but you know, the elders wait for us and they um, give us the look, you know, of, <laughs> God, when are you going to grow up? And uh, that was one of the first things an elder said to me <laughs> when I was in this feeling was uh, I wanted to help me because I was wanted to write a tribute to that 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 place and that culture. And uh, she, they said, "This is the woman you want to see, this grandma." So I went to her, and uh, she looked at me really cold. And and I was standing there on the powwow grounds, and and she said to me. If you ever grow up, you're going to be a good man. That's all she said to me. And she walked away. And I was standing there, and I was so embarrassed. And then about, she got away about 50 feet or so, and then she turned around and said, I'll help you, and then turned away. I loved her, Clara. I, uh, but they, they wait for us to grow up, you know, and and uh, stop our craziness, you know, our selfishness and self-centeredness. And, uh, yeah, they're patient with us. <laughs> I'm glad they are. <laughs> you know, from the Zen perspective, of course, this resonates so deeply mm. with us. It's the teaching of interdependence. It's the reality of interdependence. Mm. None of us have our being all by ourselves. It's yeah. all shared interbeing. Yeah. At the same time, though, it's really easy to understand that as a concept or to experience that in a zendo. But that also means here, now, yeah, yeah. Western Washington with its peoples, its flora, its fauna, its history, its prospects, its dreams, its mm -hmm. betrayals, yeah. its realities, not its abstractions. Yeah. That's hard because, you know, it is also true we're wrecking the place. We are wrecking the place. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I remember one of the elders telling me about Seattle. And of course, by American standards, it really is a beautiful city. Uh, people come here and they're so amazed by our mountains and our waters. Yeah. But he says, look, you see that beauty. I see the sorrow. Mm. I see the immense sorrow of the craziness by which this is how we've decided to live. Yeah. That we could more easily imagine the end of the whole earth and its life forms than we can imagine changing our life ways. Yes. Do you think they can wait long enough? Yeah. That's so tragic. It's so crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder, too, the dialogue has to admit, it has to begin with not just reconciliation, but self-searching and, you know, owning up to our really... Yeah. The crazy part of our own life ways. Yes. I yeah. think there's no way forward without that. I think it's our homework, yeah. <laughs> For all of the same homework. <laughs> yeah. I think the goal is, uh, I think the goal that I've been taught, I feel like the way I've been taught in the, in the Salish way, uh, is that the most holy is uh, limitless kindness and limitless generosity and limitless wisdom. And I used to see elders that in their 80s and 90s, uh, I used to just sit and watch them, the way they talked, their gestures, uh, the way they moved, and the way they were with other people. And I think that's where I first saw how that is what we are meant to embody. Mm -hmm. The what we come from is that wisdom and kindness and generosity. And we're meant to embody that, that limitless love. And I think everything in the life way points to living in that manner. Uh living, not taking too much, you know, just taking enough, but mainly giving as much as you can, 
and giving away. And I've seen that practiced so beautifully by elders and, and even by young ones sometimes. They learn it really fast. It's, it's better to be giving, giving than keeping. And uh, I just feel that that's what we're aiming towards is to be here in that manner. And then that, I think, builds the relationships that you're talking about, this respect, respect for one another and embracing one another and forgiving one another. All these things come from just our oneness with the Spirit or the Holy. And so I think, I do feel that's a very high calling and they have a way, a Coast Salish way of acknowledging like, that when a person's following that, uh, they acknowledge, they call them siab, siab, uh, to lift their hands. Uh, and uh, when they respect the way you're carrying yourself and your word, your word is honest and helpful and powerful, and they'll acknowledge you as as that, which is probably uns untranslatable siab is, is most noble, generous, kind. Mm -hmm. And then the most holy, the hacha, is, uh, is that. Nothing else. And I, I used to sometimes in my despair in my early years, I'd go to the, the grandmas would be up all night at wakes and I'd be there with them and I was shattered. I was burying so many young people and um, I get mad, and I get mad at God. I said, I can't understand this. I don't know why this, why is this happening? One after another, suicides and things. And, uh, and the grandma, I remember one night, she looked at me and she just said, uh, she didn't look at me kindly. She said, like, uh, she was looking at me like I was really dumb, which is really embarrassing. and. Um, and she said, don't you understand? Don't you understand? That the holy, you know, the holy is only good. Only good and wishes us only well. It's just we, this earth is a hard place. And it's tough here. And we, we human beings are, we get really mixed up. So, but don't, you, you can't get angry at the holy because it's good all the way through. You know, but we are a mixed bag, and uh, and we just suffer a lot because of it, and we struggle. And they say, this earth is hard, hard place, and because we make it that way, yeah, we make it, we make that, it way. that way. Yeah, and the beloved, the ones who've gone ahead, they pity us because they've been through it, and they, and here we're doing it <laughs> again, you know, and they pity us, and they want to to take us, you know, to be with them because we're, it's so difficult here. We make it very difficult here. Yeah. I think we call the Siabs Bodhisattvas in my tradition. I, that's and, interesting, yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's what we aspire to do in our practice. Yeah. Uh, we often fall short. We always fall short. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but we have to begin first by looking at our own craziness, our own blindness. You know, the problem is not the earth. Earth's not hiding. The earth's not making us suffer. We can't see who we are. We can't see what we have. Yeah. We're too crazy. Yes. You know, <laughs> the, the word for ignorance in Sanskrit, avidya, you can't see, the lack of seeing. Yeah, that's a powerful word. You know, yeah. our craziness, the, the, the Buddha called that dukkha. Mm -hmm. It was like the wheel of a wagon, but it's got broken. Mm. So it can't go forward, it just sits there and it turns on itself and it turns on itself. Yeah. And it can't even see that it's broken. That's part of the problem. That's how crazy we are. Yeah. We go around saying, well, you know, we're the Buddha's gift to human civilization and we're wrecking the place. Yeah. And we can't see that there's something really crazy about us. Yeah. And really crazy about our refusal to learn from our friends and from our teachers. It is, it's pretty sad. <laughs> it's pretty sad. But in a crazy world, yeah. I think those who try to find, as you often said in the past, to find a more sacred way of walking on the earth, mm -hmm. that's lonely sometimes, don't you think? Have you ever felt 
Mm -hmm. the loneliness of this calling I I've never I I feel I know what you're talking about somewhat I think um, I have felt very lonely at times for different reasons but um, I feel most um, unlonely or or most at home when I'm with the native people I s uh, their hearts have become my home and their kindness and so when I'm with them and trying to walk the way I feel at home totally um, and I'm not lonely I think maybe where I get lonely or feel more alone is when I try to encounter the uh, like the institutional church the churches mm -hmm. uh, where I begin to feel like I'm out on some limb you know and and I talk a language that's very hard to understand within the context of the institution and that's when I start to feel um, awkward <laughs> 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 very awkward uh, and I just still don't I still don't know what to do with that exactly because I'll sometimes I've been at, at meetings and things and I will start to say my heart and people uh, you know and that would be within the church context you know uh, and they look out the window or they tap their pencils or they uh, they just can't wait for me to stop uh, and I realize that they think I'm an utter fool an utter fool and uh, and uh, so I probably am a fool undoubtedly in many ways but especially probably to try to talk across uh, uh, there's like the Grand Canyon sometimes. Oh. Uh, you're, sh you're shouting for <laughs> this Grand Canyon because the experiences are so different on each side of what the holy is and how you, your practice and everything else. And so because I've been allowed to sort of wander over to this other side and I found a home there, it's made me a stranger, a stranger I don't think I'm a stranger to myself anymore, but I'm I'm a stranger to what I was raised in, hmm. um, and uh, that is painful. And I maybe it it probably is. I think it is a type of loneliness hmm. uh, because you're sort of isolated uh, because you can't communicate. You can't. You can't. Uh, you just can't quite get it across and and in that I have to know that I've been with the folks for 42 years now I hope forever forever and uh, so uh, I've had so much time and experience with them and so much teaching been entrusted to me and all my friends say you're so fortunate because my native friends say you're so fortunate because you've had such great teachers and I know that and I want to cry when I say that but I, that's a whole world that I can't even begin to say <laughs> to the surrounding culture wow. because they don't even know the people are here. A lot of them don't even, the Indians are invisible to them and they're certainly not important. And, uh, and occasionally, you know, the, you know, they'll get, make some news, you know, like a victory in the, for the Army Corps, you know, it gets them up. But usually they're, they're, they're invisible to some the vast population and but they're everything for me you know they're everything for me but I can't I can't transmit that feeling over to somebody else that they'd have to f come some other way I think yeah I don't I mean, know if that makes any sense it makes perfect sense <laughs> you know this is the problem of being crazy this is the, yeah. the trap that practice has to crack mm. If you know you're crazy, you're not so crazy. <laughs> you just know that you're a fool. And to be a fool, that is in the Mahayana way, mm. an honorific. Mm. It's a very precious Zen name. And I've always cherished my favorite analect by Confucius. Mm. When the Tao is ascendant, they will know you are wise. Now, when was the Tao ascendant? Probably never. But if it ever was yeah. to be ascendant, they'll know you are wise. Yes. When the Tao is not present, 
when no one can see the Tao. When we're too crazy, they'll think you're stupid. Yeah. It's easy to be wise. Who's wise enough to be stupid? <laughs> but that's the problem. That's the yeah. problem. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's the sign of our craziness that yeah. we can't see how crazy we are. Yeah. And we, as a result, you know, run to the worst possible teachers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, 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 a, uh, all I can say is, uh, I guess, I can only say I'm very fortunate myself that I've had so many that never gave up on me. So many friends and so many teachers and, and since I've been with Native people, they've never given up on me. And uh, I wish everybody had that. And, yeah. and, and, and grabbing you, just, you know, you're starting to run off a cliff, grabbing you. Or if you fall off the cliff, you know, going down and picking you up and bringing you back up again. So I've had that, and I've also had it with my Jesuit uh, mentors, my spiritual, I call them spiritual fathers. Uh, you know, they picked me up and put me together because they knew I was, I was moving in, in two, two whole different realities all the time. And, and they knew, they had a sense they didn't know that them, themselves, but they knew it was a challenge. And they, so they'd always were sympathetic to me. But those are the ones who really knew my heart. That's not a very long oh. list. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> because most, most, you know, they're so busy uh, in their, their worlds of interest. And I, I respect them, you know, it's fine. Because uh, Jesuits are in, are in everything, you know. Uh, Scientists, artists, literature, er everything, you know, it's, it's our way, but, and they're, they're really intense, and I, I enjoy that. I was just given a gift. Um, I just feel like I, uh, Jesus had that story of the man who found a treasure in the field, you know, that nobody had ever noticed, or the pearl of great price, and I'm, I feel that way. I. I've been allowed to be with the people and to find this incredible wealth of beauty and strength and meaning and friendship, deep, profound friendship and love. And uh, I don't feel worthy of it. I, I never will. Um, it's just been given to me. And my only pain is... Uh, my greatest pain is I can't share it. Mm -hmm. I, I can with the people because we're all trying to walk it. You know, my closest friends, and we're all just trying to walk this life way, the Chusada, Shalangan, and we're just trying to walk it together. But uh, I can't share it outside of that. Oh. It falls, it just seems to fall because it's, it's so subtle and so simple. It's so simple and subtle that I think that was the problem that the colonial people had. They didn't know what the people had because it's so refined what they have. I mean, a, a life based on generosity and sharing, when you, <laughs> when you're and 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 uh, nonviolent and uh, you know, it's just what is that, you know? So that just became a, a sign of weakness to the oh. colonial, you know, we'll take everything. And because the people are, are just, uh, they were doing a whole different life way. In the Northwest, it's, it's remarkable the way the peoples were with each other. Oh. Remarkable. It's all there. Uh, and then this tidal wave of um, development and <laughs> greed, <laughs> this greed and and domination and uh, entitlement and all these things just swept over them. But <laughs> they held on, <laughs> They're they hang on, they hang on. They hung on, they're here. Wow. They're still here. Yeah. Like Stephen Point always says that, from, he's from British Columbia, he's, 
magnificent person. You know, he says, I asked him once, you know, when you go places, well, I mean, when I, I travel around a bit and talk with non-Indians, you know, and he says, what would be good to say? Just, he said, just keep telling him we're here. Well, <laughs> we're here. Thank the Buddha they're here. Yeah. You know, I always take um, some consolation uh, from a line of the Tao Te Ching, you know, that what first appears to be strong, so domination, holding your place, mm -hmm. insisting upon yourself, is in the end shown to be weak. Mm -hmm. And what is first appears weak, water, flexibility, generosity. Water is always the generosity and compassion element. Uh, is in the long run shown to be strong. Wow. But you have to have, and I hear this a lot in indigenous people too, their capacity to have the long view. Yes. We're not good with the long view. We're in, we can barely make it past the quarterly <laughs> earnings <laughs> statement before yes. our lives are ruined. Yeah, yeah. You know, but in, uh, in Mahayana we have a practice to get us less stupid on this point. Mm. I mean, it's encapsulated by the image of planting a tree that can't bear fruit in your lifetime. Oh my goodness, yeah. You know, the, to have this long view. Yes. Because they're right. It yeah. becomes more and more obvious every year for those who can see just a little bit more that they're right. In the long view, right. they're right. And if we don't listen, there's gonna be not gonna be anybody left, <laughs> one way true. or the other. Yeah, really, all life forms. Yeah. Yeah, we're gonna drive ourselves off a cliff. Yes. But yeah. but some people begin to hear. You begin to hear. You plant your beautiful trees. Yeah. Um, but I know. I think also of your old friend Robert Sund, who <laughs> another person who, in his own way, yeah. heard also. Yeah. Would you mind telling me a little bit about your old friendship with with him? Oh, Robert. Yeah. He, he was a, a poet of the classic sense of the poet who starved and uh, lived totally for the one true word. That's one of his poems. Yeah. He used to say that it takes a lot, of, he told me one, it takes a lot of erasures before you find the one true word. And so he worked and worked and worked on his writing and uh, he loved to write. And he had lived in absolute poverty. He'd live in shacks uh, along the river, Skagit River, and wherever he could, somebody let him stay. And I don't know how he survived, really. I mean, one way we survived was going to a restaurant that served hors d'oeuvres for free. And I used to like to sit with him there, but that was his whole dinner was there, having these hors d'oeuvres. And, and they all knew Robert. That was in the Connor. And, um, but Lacan, uh, but Robert was just a um, magical being for me. He's a poet, mystic. He loved the Buddhist way of, of being, and um, he loved the water and the land. He had a great sense of it, and uh, he he was beautiful because he had nothing. And I suppose people could think of him as nothing. Uh, just a poor man with poor clothes, and he's very different, you know. Uh, but he's one of the richest men I've ever met in my life because of his heart and his way to find the word and and his love. And I, I miss him. I miss him. Yeah. yeah he often struck me as really embodying the spirit of a cold mountain or in Japan of a ryokan yeah. who gave up everything that he owned and just did yeah. his poetry and yeah. lived in, in squalor. Yeah. But was extremely rich. Yeah. And still somehow as such teaching us. Beautiful. With his yeah, with his very way of being. Yeah. But he was also the one who insisted that you and I, we live not in the state of Washington. We live in Ish River country. Yes. Right. He he knew that. Yes, I think that's one of his great contributions, and another way in which he really could hear yeah. our teachers were speaking about tonight. Oh, definitely. That he I appreciated that totally. This unique place. Yeah. Between these two mountain ranges and this the ocean, the rivers, and 
he had a great sense of how totally beautiful and unique this place yeah. is. Yeah, as who we are. Yeah. yeah. Well, in conclusion, um, since you have so many things that you feel you can't get out to teach, mm. would you be able to leave us with just a couple of very precious things that you've learned and maybe the audience won't get it, maybe they will, <laughs> maybe they'll get it uh, 20 years from now when someone unearthed our little recording and finally gets it. But just one or two teachings to oh. conclude our precious time together. Well, thank you. Um, I've been lucky to have many years um, and uh, that's been an enormous gift because I'm a very slow learner. And it just takes time and patience for people to teach me things. And I, I think we probably need to give ourselves that, that um, to come into oneness uh, with the holy and oneness with this sacred way of life is a wor life work and probably many lifetimes of work <laughs> in all reality. I, I've, I've seen elders come into it really solid in their 80s and 90s. They were still human beings, but they, really, they were really close to the source. But that was a whole lifetime of work. And, uh, and so I suppose it's good to give ourselves to honor our quest and to honor our roads and to realize every year, you know, we could learn more and every day, we, every day it grows. And if we're given time, that, that the knowledge gradually does come to us for our serenity and joy and what we manifest to others. Um, and uh, I think of Robert Joe, who was one of my beloved friends, um, chairman of the Swinomish, really a spiritual man. But I went in to him on my 50th birthday and, and then he said, well, 50's nothing. You still don't know anything when you're 50. And then uh, I went in on my 60th birthday and he said, you still don't know anything when you're in 60s. And then, uh, and we'd laugh, you know, we'd laugh, because I knew it was absolutely true. And then a lot of my spiritual teachers, the medicine carriers, the spiritual healers, they always say that their best work is later in their 70s and 80s and some of my greatest uh, spiritual men I've been around like Patius, T. Patius, Lummi and um, Kenny Moses Sr., uh, great, I mean great's probably not there, they wouldn't like that word, but wonderful human beings and wonderful he spiritual healers with great, very great high spiritual gifts and very extremely humble, <laughs> very humble. and. Uh, uh, but I think it was true, their, their work grows and they, their own work grows in power and, uh, and knowledge. And, but that's 70s, 80s, um, and um, into the 90s even. And you know, if their family can get them around, they, they still have all that to give. So uh, maybe that's, if we are, have to be maybe I'm very impatient with myself and but to give ourselves patience I guess you know to be patient with our search and always humble and always learning and and um, and following the way what do we ultimately have but the way that what we come from is mystery what holds us is mystery where we're, where we're headed is mystery. What we have is our way of life, our sacred way of life. Wow. And that's what we have. And so, you know, I think that's what we you know, try to become. And then I think then we get a sense of what holds us and the mystery we come from and the mystery we're heading to by following the way. But I don't think there's any other 
manner to do that, wow. <laughs> actually. And so we're lucky if we have teachers who say, this is a good way, and then you will feel it. You know, say, this, this seems right to me. I'd like to follow this. And then we try it, and we fall off the trail, and we get up, and then we dust off, and you keep going, you fall off again, and, or you get, oh, you get distracted, and, but you, you know, they pull you back, and so you keep going on it. And I feel like the way ultimately opens into light. Uh, you, the union that we anguish for, <laughs> the union we want with all living ones and with the holy, but then I think it leads us that way. Yeah, I think. Well, that's a really beautiful teaching. Yeah. You know, my, uh, my great mentor, Dogen, from the 13th century, mm -hmm. speaks of Bendola, mm -hmm. wholehearted negotiation of the way. That is that is practice. Mm -hmm. That has also been your beautiful practice, and you've been an extremely important teacher to us all. And I think as the months and years go by, I think we'll continue to realize how fortunate we are, mm -hmm. and how much hard work we have to do to receive the gift that you've given us with mm -hmm. your teachings, your word, your very way of being. Well, so thank you. I really appreciate it. I I, I um, anything that's good in me, I, <laughs> I can't attribute to myself, <laughs> but I, I feel it's the goodness that's been entrusted to me by people who have loved me and the holy that's loved me. Yeah, and Shinran's got a beautiful line about the pure about the pure land. Mm. It's really hard to get to, even for bad people. <laughs> <laughs> people forget about it. You oh. think you're good at this. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> There's no hope for us. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So, thank you so much. Well, I appreciate it, Jason. Thank you. Yeah, thank thank you. you. Thank you, Pat. I appreciate your kindness. Thank you.